Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen. I'm the program manager for the Recycling Market Center and will serve as your moderator today. We would like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the webinar management software for this series and Lisa Ruggiero and Laura Flagg of the National Recycling Coalition for assisting with the RMC with promotion and technical support. Today's webinar focus is on the repair of electronic devices. Our presenter today is Kyle Weans, who I will introduce in a moment. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you're experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. Please note that an edited version of this webinar will be made available for viewing via YouTube links on the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center websites. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, who you, you also see on the screen. I think that's a first for our webinar series. We have audio and visual. Um, <laughs> Kyle is a co-founder of iFixit, the repair community internationally renowned for open source repair manuals and product teardowns iFixit has empowered hundreds of millions of people to repair their broken stuff. Kyle has testified on electronics exports to the International Trade Commission and is actively involved in developing global environmental standards. Kyle regularly speaks on design for repair, service documentation, and the environmental impact of manufacturing. His writings have appeared in Atlantic, Harvest Business Review, Wired, Popular Mechanics, and the Wall Street Journal. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Kyle, and I'm going to turn the program over to him. Hey, thanks so much for having me. This is exciting. I uh, I spend a lot of time with recyclers. I was actually I spent all day at an electronics recycler in Oklahoma. Uh, so I'm I'm very excited to share our perspective on uh, kind of sustainability going forward and the uh, relationship that I think that repair and uh, recycling have uh, to kind of building a truly sustainable economy. Uh, so I started iFixit a while back, share a little bit of information about myself. Uh, I'm a CEO, so you know, don't believe anything CEO ever tells you. Uh, I'm also a software guy. I built uh, the iFixit website, and if you've ever hung out with engineers, you know we have opinions about everything. I'm going to share a lot of opinions with you today. And I am a tinkerer. Uh, so we have a joke around the office that's, hey, if you leave your phone around in one place for too long, somebody might take it apart. Uh, so don't do that around me. I have lots of screwdrivers. Okay, I am uh, speaking from San Luis Obispo, California. It actually doesn't look like this right now. It's raining, uh, which we're very, very excited about. Uh, it hasn't rained in a good long while, and all of our reservoirs and lakes are empty. So maybe they will fill up a little bit today. So let's talk about repair. Uh, how do people fix things, or how will people always fix things? Well, in the old school, in the dark ages of repair, I'm talking way long ago, like say 1990. So 25 years ago, how did people learn how to fix things? Well, you figure it out yourself. Uh, you know, you take something apart. Maybe, hopefully, you can you can figure it out. Things were more mechanical. It was easier that way. Uh, if you're lucky, you get your hands on a printed repair manual. And then, if you're super super dedicated, you might go to a trade school uh, and get some formal education on how to fix things. And that was sort of it. Those were your options. These days, we do things a bit differently. Uh, if we don't know how to do something, we Google it. Uh, and this is just in time learning. We go on the internet, and if the internet knows how to fix something, then I know how to fix something. If the internet doesn't know how to fix something, then I guess I'm up a creek. Uh, and I, I, maybe we're a little bit less self-sufficient than we used to, because people, if you can't find it on the internet, maybe you just won't even try. Um, but on the other hand, people are able to accomplish things with extraordinarily complicated products that they would have never been able to imagine without help online. I was trying to fix my truck, uh, and I Googled around, and I was able to find uh, some information that was great. Uh, so iFixit is kind of that place. We are a community for people to teach each other how to fix things. Uh, we have a way where people can post their own repair guides. You can search around. I was searching for how to uh, fix a transmission issue on my Honda, and I came across an iFixit tutorial that somebody had posted, and it was exactly what I needed to follow. It's fantastic. So our mission is to make it easy for people to be able to teach each other how to fix things uh, and simple for then people to follow those instructions to do their own repairs. So what kind of repairs do we have? Well, we've got motorcycles. So we have, this is uh, from a Harley-Davidson oil change guide. Uh, we have tractors. We've been doing a lot of work with agricultural st stuff this year. Uh, however, uh, where we spend a lot of our time focusing is on electronics. 
And we, you know, I kind of got my background starting with repairing Apple products. I used to work in the Apple Repair Center. Uh, before I started, I fixed it. So we have a lot of expertise around electronics. Uh, and we kind of think of ourselves as the Repair World Research and Development Department. Now, that's not us being the entity that as I fix it, it really is this distributed collection of experts around the world that are really good uh, at fixing specific things and they share their knowledge and in aggregate, all of us are smarter than any of us alone. So this is what I fix it looks like. You go on and you say, okay, I'm interested in repairing a camera or I want to learn how to use a multimeter and we have tutorials that will get you started. Now we also have fun and there's a lot of crazy stuff on the website. People post whatever they're interested in. Uh, so this is actually a replica lightsaber that somebody posted and said, hey, uh, let's see let's see how you, you get inside this thing. So repair doesn't have to be work. It can be a lot of fun too. Uh, we got in, this is uh, if you accidentally cut off your hand in the course of repairing a lightsaber, it's okay. You can use a bionic hand. Uh, and this is removing the crystal power source and there's the entire lightsaber taken apart. Uh, this is actually a replica that's made by a software engineer. He's phenomenally dedicated to it. He does a really good job. Uh, this is probably better than the prop that they use in the movie. People post teardowns for all kinds of things. I know in the recycling industry we see all kinds of crazy old stuff coming through all the time. This is actually the first product that ever had the Sony logo on it. Uh, and it, inside it's just as retro cool. Uh, these are the old uh, parts. If you have an electronics background, you might uh, be able to look and uh, the cylindrical things in the center with the, the colored stripes, those are uh, codes for the resistor value. So you can actually identify what type of component it is from the color coding on it. And you can see if you look close that they're actually hand painted on there. This is Pleo. Pleo is a toy robot dinosaur. Uh, Pleo has sensors in his skin and when you pet him, he purrs. Uh, he was absolutely adorable. Uh, it really pained me to have to take Pleo apart, but that's what we do. We take things apart. So I got a scalpel and I cut Pleo open and this is the inside. Pleo is phenomenally complex. There were something like 90 screws and a dozen circuit boards and a bunch of motors. Uh, some, of, some of the products are simple to get in. Some are complicated. Pleo is complicated out of necessity. Uh, pretty darn cool product though. Uh, I was really, really impressed by the engineering. And that's something that's kind of fun about taking things apart in general is we get to learn all the clever things that the engineers came up with to make this stuff tick. Okay, so why do we want to bother uh, repairing or recycling this stuff? Why not just make things and landfill them? Well, aside from the potential toxins that can leach into the water table, uh, there is a huge amount of raw material in our products. It takes over 500 pounds of raw material to make an 8-ounce cell phone, and there's a lot of metals in these things. So how good are we at recycling those metals? Well, this is a uh, data we pulled from a UN electronics uh, recycling project. They did a metals recycling report. And what they wanted to know was how good are we if we recycle electronics at getting the metals back out. And so the green ones, things like copper, nickel, zinc, uh, silver, gold, were very good at getting them back out of electronics. Uh, unfortunately, all, a lot of elements we can't, including things like indium, um, and uh, a number of rare earth elements. Uh, the lithium in lithium ion batteries is not recoverable in recycling um, and so we're always going to be going back and mining more lithium. So this is really a challenge. Out of all of the elements, there's only about 11 of them that are readily recoverable in recycling. Um, best case estimates are if you look at the entire weight of a phone, maybe we can get 70% of the weight uh, recovered in recycling. And, and I'm, when I say recycling, I really mean downcycling. The, the plastics are never going to be used in another cell phone again. So we looked at this and we said, okay, uh, recycling isn't going to work well for electronics at scale. I mean, it, it will recover some of the material, but we're losing, we're losing a lot of valuable materials. So what can we do? Um, to solve this, and really the only strategy, if we can't improve the recycling process, and the metallurgists I talk to tell me that it's very, very challenging to do, uh, we need to focus on extending the life of these products. If we're going to make a cell phone, and we know that we're going to lose a lot of the value of that in recycling, then we have to focus on making that cell phone last for as long as possible. And that's what we do at iFixit. Um, why, why do I care so much about extending the lifespan? Well, the, the raw materials that go into these things have an enormous cost. Both, both in dollars and in energy, but also, also in lives. There's a lot of conflict minerals that can end up in these things. Uh, despite Frank Dodd, you still end up with a lot of conflict minerals in the electronics industry. We're running low on indium, uh, which is one of those elements that can't be recovered in recycling. Um, you know, 
the mining in general is incredibly challenging. And I mean, this is why we go into recycling in the first place. We get in the environmental sector because we care about these things, uh, but recycling isn't going to solve it completely for us. So the Pope has been posting on Twitter. He released his environmental encyclical, uh, and as, after that, he started posting some things, and I thought this was um, kind of inspiring. He's like, look, we are not taking care of the planet. Um, the result, if you, or the cause of this, if you look at, at like what is the source, the source is people just consuming too much. We know this. We have to find a way that we can get people to change this throwaway culture. Um, a lot of people have said, well, it's the increase in, in products is just an increase in population growth. I think that's a way of the first world blaming the third world for our problems. It's not so much population growth as it is just everybody wants lots of things, and the things that we want don't last all that long. Like, a uh, washing machine that you buy these days might only last five or seven years. Uh, so this is a challenge. So what can we do to solve this? Well, there's a lot to talk about a circular economy. So traditional recycling circular economy is you know, we use things for a while, we shred it, we recover the material, and we, we make new stuff out of it. A full circular economy factors in every stage of, of the product life cycle and figures out how we can build an economy around each stage. So there's a lot of talk about the circular economy in Europe. There's a lot of wonderful economic analysis that's been done by consultants like McKinsey uh, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And what they have realized is that there's a lot of economic value that can be gained from extending product lives uh, without necess and, and postponing recycling until the last possible minute. So each of these stages is a loop, and so uh, when the user has it, they might repair it, they might upgrade it, that generates economic value. Uh, when they're done with it, it might go to a refurbisher who'd refurbish it, resell it to somebody else, um, and then finally recycling. So at each of those stages, you're losing a little bit of value, um, uh, but you're hopefully postponing recycling until the last possible moment. That's the moral kind of future-looking argument. What's the practical argument? All of you know this. Uh, commodities are in, uh, <laughs> in trouble right now. So I end up spending a lot of time talking with recyclers where they're saying, hey, I'm not making any money anymore. Help. And I say, okay, let's talk about fixing things because anytime you can repair something, you're going to generate more economic value. So there's a wonderful study that the state of Illinois did a few years back, and they said, hey, landfilling a 1,000 tons of electronics doesn't really create any jobs. Recycling them creates 15 jobs, but if you can repair them, it creates 200 jobs. So all of a sudden, hey, this is kind of exciting because we have something where uh, you, can, you can generate more economic value from it, you can create jobs, uh, and, and it's going to be more resource effective. Um, so we tend to put all of, our, all of our efforts, I put all of my efforts into trying to improve and grow the repair economy. Uh, and something that I don't think that we have historically thought about is that repair jobs are green jobs. So your mechanic down the street who's making a car last longer, uh, that's a green job. The cell phone repair guy in the mall, that's a green job. I think traditionally we've thought of green jobs as solar manufacturing, um, you know, a, a lot of, of these kind of clean energy uh, startups. But, but if you look at like on an energy saving productivity perspective, these repair folks are doing tremendously positive things for the for the ecosystem uh, and and we so I would I would challenge you as as you go back and, and we think and we write future reports like we really need to be recategorizing the entire repair ecosystem which is about three percent of American employment by the way it's millions of people in the US are doing repair all of those jobs are, are green jobs and we should be incentivizing them this is a photo from Patagonia's Repair Center in Reno, and I'll talk about, uh, about that a little bit. But repair creates jobs. Um, this is a chart of uh, the economic opportunity around uh, just fixing iPhones. Um, I mean, $10 billion opportunity there. There's billions of dollars of opportunity out there just ready for the taking if we can improve our effectiveness of fixing things. Okay, so what are, the, what are the challenges to fixing things, or who is good at fixing some things? Why are other things not getting fixed? There's this perception that, oh, well, electronics are small. You can't fix electronics these days. It's patently false. There are millions, tens of millions of iPhones that are repaired every year. Um, lots of other electronics as well, but let's talk about phones for a moment. So uh, there are about seven iPhones that have most of the market share. In general, Apple makes very few models. You know, They release a new model every year. So I have an iPhone 6 here. It's 30% of the install base. That means that if you're a repair shop and you specialize in seven things and you, you can stock parts for those seven models, there's a lot of efficiencies in addressing millions of products with very few models. 
This is why you see car repair shops specialize, and they'll say, well, I only work on Hondas, or I only work on European cars. There's a lot of benefits to specialization. There's fewer parts you have to stock. There's uh, you know, less knowledge that you have to gain on a repair-by-repair -repair basis. So a lot of models helps a lot. And this is a big part of why uh, you'll see people fixing more iPhones than Android phones, is that there's relatively few iPhone models. Uh, how many Android models are there? Well, I have a chart for you. So this graph is absolutely crazy. This is the fragmentation in the Android market. Every single one of these rectangles is a different Android phone. The top left of this chart is the various Galaxy phones that Samsung sells. So Samsung has the best-selling Android phones. And then you can get into the HTCs and the Motorola's. But you get all the way down, there are literally thousands of Android phone models. Um, and different than a lot of other things, every single phone needs a different repair process. So repairing a Samsung S5 is completely different than repairing a Samsung S6. And the parts are different. So even the battery isn't the same between them. Even the screen isn't the same between them. You need a separate set of parts for each of them. So this is the great tragedy of the material economy in this modern consumer age. And I think you know this as you look at recycling streams. It's not very uh, homogenous. There are a lot of different products coming through. And you know, if you had 10,000 of the same thing, yeah, you can get efficient at fixing it. But if you have 10,000 different things, all of a sudden it's a much, much harder repair challenge. So this is why we focus on getting information online and really trying to solve this heterogeneous environment by giving people one place where they can go and learn how to fix everything. So we've really focused on scale. We're saying, okay, if there are thousands of Android phones, then let's write thousands of repair manuals so that a technician doesn't have to know how to fix a Samsung Galaxy S6. If he's, solved an S, if he's repaired an S5 before and an S6 comes into the shop, he can look online, look up the information, learn just in time, and perform the repair. And if that sounds crazy, how could he possibly learn just in time how to do this? Well, the car repair shops do the same thing. You take your car to a mechanic. He might not have worked on that specific year. He might have never worked on a 2003 Ford Explorer before, but he's worked on a 2000 Ford Explorer, and he knows generally, and he has access to a supply chain and training and information from Ford. And so if there's something that he doesn't know, he can look it up. Well, we're providing the same thing. We're providing a supply chain, so we sell parts and tools, and, and we're providing the information so that you can learn just in time. You have a problem come up. You have a specific thing. You've never learned how to repair it before. There is a source of information for you. And this is how the internet works. This is how Wikipedia works. If you have a conversation about elephants and you don't know that much about elephants and you're interested in learning what are the different types of elephants, what's the difference between an Asian and an African elephant, we can Google it and Wikipedia will come up and we can learn just in time. We're doing the same thing with repair. So this is, this is iFixit. We cover a huge spectrum of products. So if you dive in and you say, okay, well, let's look at iPhone, then we, you, we have you pick and you say, well, which iPhone do you have? And you say, okay, you know, this is the phone model I have. We'll cover you know, Androids, Blackberries, you name it. We'll get into very specific things. So if you're having an error 53, whatever the heck that is, we've got information on it and you can find uh, a thriving community. Uh, and, and so what we've done is we've bundled these step-by-step -step repair instructions with troubleshooting information, with a, a Q&A forum, so that you can diagnose your problem, figure out how to, what, what the issue is, and then how to, how to do the swap. Uh, and everything that we do is open license. So we release it under the Creative Commons license. Uh, and this is important for a couple of reasons. One is it means that iFixit content never stands still. If we write a repair guide for installing a new screen in this iPhone, and somebody figures out a better way, they just click edit on our guide, they improve it, they make a suggestion, and it gets better. The other thing that's important about this is that if iFixit gets hit by a meteor and we disappear tomorrow, all of our content has been released under an open license so that it will be around forever. And this is, this is really fundamentally critical uh, for making sure that over the long term everybody has access to knowing how to fix their things, that they're not dependent on us as, a, as an entity. This information, we released it into the, the public domain and, and the Creative Commons license allows people to, uh, to use it for all kinds of things. And we've seen people do amazing things. There's a group of folks in Turkey who are really excited about our information, but it wasn't in Turkish, and so they translated a bunch of manuals into Turkish. And we love seeing that kind of innovation built on top of the information we put out. Okay, let's talk about some specific repairs that are not iPhones. So this is a Starbucks barista. This probably doesn't look like your neighborhood Starbucks barista. This is an espresso machine that they made. Uh, and somebody gave me one. And they said, hey, Kyle, will you please fix my espresso machine? 
And if you're saying, well, why are people coming to you asking you to fix your espresso machine? I don't even know how espresso machines work. But the danger of running a, a website called iFixit is everybody comes to me and asks me their repair questions. So in this case, I didn't know how to fix it. So I said, well, maybe I'll just take it apart. So I took it apart. I put some instructions online. And I just said, look, this is how you take the thing apart. And these are the main components. And that was it. I didn't post any information on how to fix it. I just posted, this is how you take it apart. Well, I got an email from someone a week later that said, hey, thanks so much. I used your instructions to fix my espresso machine. And I was kind of scratch scratching my head because I was like, I didn't teach you how to fix anything. But she says, no, I took it apart, and I was able to clean it, and I put it back together, and it works great. And then people went on, and they started asking, like, adding all kinds of diagnostic procedures. So this is like, hey, if you take a uh, multimeter and you measure the resistance across these two points, it'll tell you if the, uh, the heating element is working or not. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. So this open source model means that if we put this information online, people start to build on top of it. And that's very, very exciting. Okay, uh, so that's iFixit. Let's talk about something outside of iFixit a little bit. Let's talk about some policies that uh, can help repair and some policies that can hurt repair. And, and not just repair, but product longevity in general. Because the goal at the end of the day, whether you're fixing it or just taking care of something and making sure you don't break it, is to make the stuff last as long as possible. So we had a situation a couple years ago in the U.S. where due to a fluke of copyright law, the U.S. became the only country in the world where it was illegal to unlock your cell phone. So what does unlocking a cell phone mean? It means that if I buy this phone and it's on Verizon and I want to move it to AT&T, I can't because it's locked down. We've all run into this issue. Maybe you go overseas, you want to get a SIM card, you can't because your phone is locked. Well, there's all kinds of tools that will let you unlock the phones, but uh, copyright law was saying, no, you can't actually do that. So uh, some activists online put a petition together and asked the White House and said, please make unlocking cell phones legal. Now, this might seem like a consumer rights issue, but I would argue that this is an environmental issue because if, if you look at the value of a phone, um, let's say that you have an older phone and it's worth $10. If that phone is locked and you can only use it in a certain place in the world, maybe it can only be used in the U.S., nobody wants a $10 cell phone in the U.S., uh, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to get thrown in the landfill, it's going to get recycled. But in, say, Kenya, people might be very excited to have a $10 cell phone. So you have the difference between something that if it's locked, it's, it's not worth anything. We just need to shred it, we need to destroy it. And if it's unlocked, all of a sudden it has a use to somebody in the world and maybe you can get a couple more, more years of, of use out of it before we have to recycle it. So this is an environmental issue. So I helped rally a bunch of folks together. We got 114,000 signatures. Um, and uh, we said, hey, you should do something about this. And then I started writing editorials, and we, uh, I wrote in The Atlantic. I said, hey, the White House uh, has this petition saying that we should unlock phones. The White House actually responded to the petition and said, yes, we agree, but Congress has to do something. Um, and so it was up to Congress. So I actually got to fly back and forth to D.C. several times and say, hey, guys, you need to work on this. And it was really interesting going to a lot of, say, Democratic uh, representatives and talking to them about cell phone unlocking and explaining to them that this is an environmental issue. And this was a completely new concept to them, that a copyright problem, uh, you know, something that has to do with what you can do with the software on your phone would actually have environmental implications. But if you look at the scale of phones, Globally, we manufactured over 1.6 billion cell phones in 2015. Huge number of phones. And if we can extend the life of all of those phones by a couple years, it means we don't have to keep making billions more phones every year. We can slow down the pace of manufacturing. We can slow down the pace of material extraction. And we can really focus on, on getting the maximum utility out of these things that we've already manufactured. Okay. So what does Congress do? Congress went ahead and passed a bill, and Obama signed it. And we managed to re-legalize cell phone unlocking. And I would argue, in terms of laws that Obama has signed, that this is the most significant environmental legislation that the Obama administration has signed. Uh, and I talk with a lot of sustainability folks, and look at me like I'm crazy. But one, he hasn't signed very much environmental legislation because Congress has been, has been getting in his way. And two, we didn't tell the Republicans it was an environmental issue. We told them it was a consumer rights issue uh, and a property rights issue, and they got on board with that. So this was bipartisan. It was uh, passed by the majority, I mean, overwhelming majority of Congress, uh, and Obama signed it. So this is very, very exciting. So now you can legally unlock your phone. So maybe this will make your life a little bit happier, but it also is really having dramatic environmental impacts. And I was visiting uh, the, uh, this electronics recycler yesterday, and they're actively, they're unlocking dozens of phones a day. 
uh, and then reselling them around the world. It's very, very exciting. Cool. So let me talk about the products themselves. A lot of people say, well, okay, that's, you know, this repair thing is cool, but can I actually do the repair on my device? Is this something I can do or do I have to take it to an expert? And the answer is it depends. It depends on the product design and it depends on kind of your expertise level. It depends on if you have repair information. Fortunately, uh, we're pretty good at getting repair information online for the popular phones. So you're probably going to have repair information. So then it really comes down to how hard is it to do the fix. And that varies completely by, by the type of phone that it is. So we release here, these are rankings of all the phones out there on the market, or at least the popular phones, and how easy or hard they are to take apart. Um, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm realizing I took the screenshot. I'm going to show you a phone later that actually scored toward the top of this list as well. Okay, so these are the phones at the top of the list, and these are the phones at the bottom of the list. Now, that's not the new iPhone on the bottom of the list. That's the original iPhone. The new iPhone actually is uh, a 7, so it's, it's in between these two screenshots. Uh, and the worst phone that we have ever taken apart is the HTC One, which actually was a really well uh, uh, top-selling phone that has a lot of problems. So let's talk about two phones that came out this fall. These are two Android flagship phones. Uh, one is the Nexus 5X and the other is the Nexus 6P. So these are Google's two flagship phones. The Nexus 5X is made by LG and the Nexus 6P is made by Huawei. Uh, and and the, the main difference between these phones from a consumer's perspective is just that one has a bigger screen. So the 5 is 5 inch screen, the 6 is a 6 inch screen but they are completely different inside. They're made by two completely different manufacturers. So you might be looking at this you know, in, in the store and say, well, do I want the one with the smaller screen or the bigger screen? But there's huge differences inside in how they're put together. So to get inside uh, the LG phone, you actually just pop the back panel off. And there it is. And you can see the battery is really straightforward and easy to get to. You use standard Phillips screws. There we can pop the battery out. Uh, all of the internal connectors are these press fit connectors. So those, those gold stripes that you see there, that's the headphone jack, and that's a, a press fit connector. So it's very, very straightforward and easy to get in and repair. If you have wobbly hands, it's okay. Uh, this is a really nice modular design. It makes it really easy to get the whole thing open. Uh, we put toy cars in this picture to make it fun. Okay, so this is a phone that scores very, very high on our repairability index. It's really straightforward and easy to, to take it apart. You can look at this from a recycling perspective and see that it's straightforward to separate out the plastic components from the battery. Uh, this would be a very fast and economical phone to recycle. Okay, the Huawei Nexus 6P. First thing we have to do to get inside is actually heat this thing up. So what you're seeing here is we're using a guitar pick and we're prying up an adhesive that we've heated loose. Uh, to get at a couple screws, and then we had to use an X-Acto knife, and I've actually got an X-Acto knife here, and we use the X-Acto knife, and we have to pry off more things, and then we had to use this crazy suction cup contraption to, to loosen the whole thing to get inside, and then you see we haven't even gotten close to the battery yet. The battery is covered up by a bunch of these connectors. Keep working our way in, get to the battery. The battery is glued in, and we have to use more heat and heart prying, and like by the time we got to the battery, it took us over half an hour to get to this point, and then we're prying the battery, and there's this adhesive on the back. It's crazy. And then there's the USB port, there's the cameras, getting the main board out, and finally then we get to the display. So the display is the last thing you get out. Well, that's the most common repair component. So this phone scored very, very low on our repairability index. We weren't super happy with the product design. Uh, and it's interesting because you have two manufacturers that were accomplishing the same thing. Both phones are selling reasonably well. One is completely impossible to repair or recycle. The other is really, really easy and nice to repair and recycle. Uh, and unfortunately, there's no obvious way for a consumer to know. So if you go into your local Verizon store and you look at these two phones, you would never know that one of them is really environmentally friendly and the other is really, really bad. Uh, so this is something that we have to solve. And we put these repairability scores out there, but then it's really up to everybody else to take this information and start to use it. Uh, and we're starting to have some impact. We have a lot of press. The technology press pays attention to our repairability indexes. Uh, but we need more people to build on top of this information because we certainly can't influence the entire market by ourselves. Uh, but I can tell you, if I was to go out and buy an Android phone today, it would absolutely be the LG uh, Nexus 5X. And LG has been recognized for this. They actually won ISRI, the Scrap Recycling Association's uh, Design for Recycling Award last year for similar product designs that they have done. So you always think of LG as a leading environmental company, but they're actually doing a really good job, and it's, it's not easy. It's not accidental that these products are turning out this way. They're really deliberately thinking through the product design all the way through, uh, and I have a lot of respect for their design team. A company I have a lot of respect for as well is Patagonia. 
So Patagonia, known for sustain, leading in sustainability, uh, they, they've been working with us on teaching people how to repair their products. So you'd say, well, Patagonia does all the green things. Of course they're doing this. Well, there's a, there's a bottom line in it for them. So Patagonia has a lifetime warranty on their products, uh, but sometimes their repair team gets backed up. And so if you want to repair your, your product and not send it into them, uh, they'll teach you how. And so they, they taught us how to repair their products, and then we wrote a bunch of repair guides for everything from luggage to clothing, and we post them on our website. And it has been working really, really well. Uh, they are uh, they're helping people fix all kinds of crazy stuff. I got an email from Annie Leonard the other day, and she says, "Hey, uh, my daughter ripped her jacket, and I was able to use the repair guide to fix it." So that's uh, that's exciting. Uh, and uh, the, these you know the, they've got customers telling their stories. So they found that that this brand loyalty around people knowing that these products stand the test of time has really been valuable to them. It's also saving them money because every customer that fixes something themselves instead of sending it into their repair center. Uh, is is saving them labor. So the Patagonia partnership that we've been doing has been working really, really well. Uh, I tend to focus on electronics a lot, but we actually have learned how to sew on iFixit, and, and uh, the guides are, are quite popular. So that's a manufacturer that's doing some good things. Let me talk to you about a manufacturer that's not Huawei that's doing bad things. So the Japanese company Toshiba. So th there's a guy in uh, Australia named Tim, and Tim runs a website that teaches people how to fix laptops. His website is called Tim's Laptop Repair Manuals. It's not the most exciting website name. Uh, and Tim got a bunch of Toshiba repair manuals and put them up on his website. Uh, and these are just you know, repair manuals that the normal service uh, you know, tech would have. Uh, there's nothing proprietary in these, but they're manuals that Toshiba wrote. Toshiba sends him this letter. And they say, Dear Tim Hicks, we understand that you're the owner and editor of the Tim.au website. Uh, on your website, we can say that you're distributing copyright repair manuals that are proprietary to Toshiba. These manuals are available only to Toshiba authorized service providers under strict confidentiality agreements. You are not an authorized Toshiba service provider and therefore have no rights to these manuals. So to comply with our request, immediately disable the links, remove the manuals, or we will take whatever steps are available to us and go after you. So Toshiba is threatening to sue poor Tim for putting repair manuals on their website for free just to teach people how to fix things. And they're saying that these are confidential and proprietary. These, this information is widely available. Knowing how to repair these things is not proprietary to these companies. Uh, but Toshiba and Apple and Sony and lots of other companies are using copyright to prevent people from fixing things. And this is a real challenge. Uh, and this is a big reason why on iFixit, instead of posting the manufacturer repair manuals, we're afraid of doing that because somebody like Toshiba or Apple would come after us. So we write our own repair manuals. And it's a huge amount of duplicative work. There's a huge environmental cost associated with us not getting around to posting a repair manual for these things. So this is kind of crazy that we have these manufacturers creating these project products, throwing them over the fence to us, selling them to us, and then saying, absolutely by no means should you have the information that is needed to repair them. Uh, and your independent local uh, you know, computer mechanic can't work on them either. So we were annoyed enough with Toshiba that we went ahead and made them a new logo. This is the new Toshiba logo. Uh, leading obsolescence. I think that is a more fitting tagline for them. Uh, and Toshiba, if you're listening, we would love to work with you and share your repair information and find a way to be more environmentally sustainable. But at the moment, uh, they are at the bottom of our list of good manufacturers. Manufacturers are doing more and more things that are making things hard for people to repair. Uh, this is a cartoon that ran in Wired Magazine the other day. There are more and more of these challenges that are making it hard for people to fix things. Everything from copyright that is going into cell phones to copyright on repair manuals that people don't have access to. And so there's this growing right to repair movement. Uh, and so what is right to repair? Well, right to repair says that if you're going to make a product, you should be responsible for the entire product's life cycle lifetime. So you can think of it like extended producer responsibility. Um, and what they're saying is, hey, if you're going to make a product, provide us with the repair information, the parts, and the tools that we need to fix it. Uh, you know, we're happy to buy the parts from you, just make them available. You might not know, Apple doesn't sell parts for the iPhone. So if you want to get a new battery for the iPhone, you can't buy a new battery from them. Uh, Amazon doesn't sell new batteries for the Kindle. You want a new battery for a Kindle? Tough, you're out of luck. Maybe you can find one on eBay but you're not going to get it from Amazon. And most electronics manufacturers are this way. 
Car manufacturers are not, however, and the reason is that there are all these right to repair laws that require car manufacturers to sell parts. The most recent one was passed in Massachusetts in 2012. If you're from Massachusetts, you might be familiar with this. And uh, it, this, there was a ballot initiative, and it asked people in Massachusetts, hey, do you want to be able to take your car to a local repair shop to get it fixed? 88% of people said, yes, of course, this is an obvious thing. Of course, I want to be able to get my car fixed. Uh, and uh, so the Massachusetts law extended a lot of these right to repair protections to the computers inside these cars. So we're starting to see initiatives like this in electronics. Um, and uh, there are you know, some manufacturers that are supportive of this. You have a manufacturer called Fairphone where they're designing a cell phone and they're making the tools, parts, manuals available with the phone. Uh, they're doing it in open formats, like O-Manual is an open interchange format for manufacturers like Fairphone to share their, their uh, disassembly procedures with both recyclers and repairers. Uh, and Fairphone is really committing to this so much that they actually include an app on the phone that has the repair manual for the phone, which seems like common sense. Everything should come with the repair manual for it. Uh, but Fairphone is one of the few. They're the only cell phone manufacturer that I know of that's doing this. So what are the requirements for a kind of robust, independent repair ecosystem? Well, you need parts, tools, and software. Uh, you need the service manuals, diagrams, uh, and then you need the ability to unlock them or have the diagnostic software. It's not all that hard, uh, but the manufacturers have this stuff, and they're specifically not sharing it with everybody else. So there is an electronics right to repair campaign moving. Uh, you can go to digitalrighttorepair.org to check out the campaign. Uh, and they have introduced legislation in Massachusetts, Minnesota, New York, and actually since I made this slide, uh, I have heard that Nebraska is going to be introducing legislation. So if you're in any of those states, uh, definitely, definitely check out the Digital Right to Repair website. Uh, and if you're in a state where you would be interested in something like this, talk to me because we have uh, draft sample legislation and we're interested in moving this in as many states as possible. This hasn't passed anywhere, but everywhere that it's been introduced, it's gotten a really positive response from the local recycling and repair communities. All right, so to step back a moment from that and just say, well, what would it take to actually have a sustainable electronics industry? We need to build a circular economy by supporting local repair shops. These local shops are green jobs and we need to be supporting them. We need to improve product design and design products for end of life. Design them for a long, robust uh, life cycle. And that means quality products that can be disassembled readily. We need to make consumables like batteries easy for anybody to replace. It's absolutely preposterous to have a phone like this with a battery that only lasts a year or two years and tell the, the person who bought it, no, you can't replace the battery yourself. That's ridiculous. That's like selling, telling someone, hey, you bought this car, but when the tires wear out, just throw it away and buy a new car. It's, it's ludicrous, not to mention environmentally an, uh, <laughs> a bad thing. Uh, and, and we need to empower consumers by making it easy to let them fix their own stuff. Um, one of the major challenges that we have seen in that, in that Huawei phone is, is adhesives. We shouldn't be gluing products together. Screws are a good thing. They're good, uh, they're good for repair and they're good for recycling. Um, and finally, we need to make all of this service information available. And I think all of this is readily achievable. Uh, we just have to decide as an environmental community and as consumers that we're going to demand these things from manufacturers. So that's my overview of iFixit and some of the policy things that we've been working on. At this point, I would love to turn it back over to the moderators and take any questions that any of you have about anything that we're working on. Thanks for listening. All right, thanks, Kyle. Appreciate that uh, presentation. That was excellent. Uh, a lot of good, good information. Uh, so right, we're now going to field some questions for, for Kyle. Again, if you have a question, please enter them on or in the GoToWebinar dialog box. And so we have a couple already. Uh, the one uh, attendee asked, Kyle, is the uh, information on the repairability rating on your website? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I guess I can go back over and I'll show my screen. And let me just go over to my web browser. So we can go to ifixit.com. Uh, and then if you scroll to the bottom, you will see there's this phone and tablet repairability list. And so you can go here and then you can see these are all the phones. And you can sort them by release date so I can see what the newest phones that we've analyzed. So here's the 6P that I was talking about and the 5X and the new iPhones. And, uh, and then you can also see for tablets, so I told you the iPhone scores reasonably well on the repairability list. Uh, the iPads actually score very poorly. So the iPads are down here at the bottom. Uh, so Apple knows how to make repairable products, and they do it sometimes. 
Um, below the iPads are actually the Microsoft Surface tablets. They're, uh, they're very poor. So this is good information. And, and this is being integrated into more and more sustainable purchasing standards. Uh, one thing that I didn't talk about that we could use some help on is that there is a federal environmental purchasing tool called EPEAT. E-P-A, E-P-E-A-T, EPEAT. Uh, and EPEAT ha is a voluntary standards body that uh, works to set environmental criteria. Uh, we have been involved in this standards group for a number of years. And I am sad to say that we have not managed to include any of these design for recycling or design for repair criteria into the EPEAT standard. It's a tremendously weak standard. And the primary reason is that there just haven't been enough uh, repair and recycling groups involved in the standard to offset the manufacturer's influence. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go to the manufacturers and say, hey, we think that it would be worth points in the standard. Like, you should have points if you don't use any glues in your product. And they'll say, no, we need complete design flexibility. And we'll say, hey, we think it would be a good idea if you got extra points or if in order to get gold standard, you have to make a repair manual available. And they, they uh, throw up every excuse and smoke screen in the book to prevent that from happening. So the only way that we can, we can really combat that is to uh, you know, have enough support. So we need more people involved in these environmental standards uh, in order to really have an impact. Uh, it's a commitment, but I think it's a commitment that will have a big impact. Okay, uh, this uh, attendee asked if you could give Tim's website again. Yeah, it's Tim. Uh, I I just always Google Tim's laptop service manuals. Yeah, and this is uh, Tim.id.au. This is the website. Uh, and he says, if you come to this webpage looking for Toshiba service manuals, too bad for you. <laughs> this is this is his blog post about the whole situation. Good. Early on, you mentioned uh, uh, plastic recovered from recycled smartphones uh, can't be used for uh, recovered plastic from smartphones can't be reused to make another one. Uh, right. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so the issue is mixed streams. And I mean, this is the classic challenge with plastic. Um, the, the plastics that they use in electronics are very, very high grade plastics. Um, particularly the, the, the plastics that are going to be in contact with parts of your body or your face. They have extremely high standards for those, and so I have never really heard of any, you know, uh, plastics out of phones being repurposed in phones. It ends up getting used in a mixed stream, and then it, you know, it's used to make park benches or highway dividers or something like that. Um, and and a, a big part of the reason for that is that. It, it's really hard to separate separate the plastics out from everything else. And so it ends up getting run through a shredder, and then after the shredder, then they're trying to sort the plastics out. And um, you know, with, with something like a CRT monitor where you have a lot of the same kind of plastic and you can shred just CRT monitor casings or just LCD monitor casings, and they're all the same color, uh, maybe you could do something with it. But I, I don't, the electronics recyclers that I know aren't getting a grade of shred out of their facilities um, that is high enough uh, to go back into electronics manufacturing. Now, I just ragged on EP. Let me say something positive about EP is EP has put some criteria for using some post-consumer recycled plastic into phones. It's not generally post-cell phone consumer recycled plastic, uh, but it is it is some post-consumer recycled plastic into phones and, and laptops. And so uh, EP has actually really driven the market and there are some post-consumer plastics that actually are worth more than brand new uh, virgin plastics. And that's substantially a result of the EPEAT standard. So it clearly has been effective in some areas and it can drive market demand and it would be nice to see more of that. Uh, and I will happily defer additional discussion on that question to the plastics experts in the audience because you all probably know more about it than I do. Okay, the next question is on Extended Product Responsibility, or EPR. What are your thoughts on EPR and how it can help e-cycling and the circular yeah. economy? Yeah, so one of the major ideas behind EPR was we, were, we said, hey, if the electronics manufacturers are on the hook for recycling these things, and they have to pay the cost for recycling them, which could be very high, then they're going to have an incentive to design products that are more recyclable. Uh, and this seems completely reasonable, right? Make the electronics manufacturers pay for recycling and they will design more recyclable products. It has categorically failed at doing that. And if you talk with anyone who is involved in drafting these EPR rules and you know, show them current product designs, they'll say, like, this has just been a categorical failure. It has certainly funded a lot of recycling programs, but it has not modified product designs at 
whole. Uh, and there's a few reasons for this. One is the manufacturers never get back their own product. They get back everybody else's product. So if you imagine you're out there and you have 5% market share in PC laptops, and then you, you're funding a recycling stream and you get you know a million tons of laptops back, only 5% of those are your product. So even if you have the most recyclable thing, it's only going to save you at most 5% of, of your recycling budget. Um, so you kind of have a tragedy of the common situation where the manufacturers aren't directly tied uh, to the benefits that they get from, from improving product design. Uh, there are a number of other reasons why EPR just hasn't worked. It's the, the folks in the environmental compliance recycling uh, parts of these companies are not generally giving feedback to the product designers. A lot of times they're on compliance and they don't really have the capability of telling the designers what to do. Um, there's also like this time lag and the electronics industry moves so quickly that on the list of priorities for the product designers, you know, having a product that's going to that's gonna be sexier and sleeker than the competition is way up here, and having a product that's recyclable is like the last possible thing on the list. Uh, and you certainly see this. I mean, even Apple, who claims that they have recyclable products, they just released the Apple Pencil, which is completely unrecyclable. It has a no trash can icon on it because it has a battery, so it's, it's a wheelie bin. You know, you can't put this in the trash, but you also can't recycle it because it has a battery in it that will be an ignition source and a shredder. So don't throw it away and don't recycle it. I don't know what you're going to do with these Apple pencils. Okay, here's a follow-up question to that. Do you engage with or see any evidence of universities or students working with or working to help change the future direction of electronics design industry? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there's there's a few different initiatives. One is, and I'm I'm just going to Google since I have a screen. So Autodesk has a thing called the Autodesk Sustainability um, Workshop. And, and this is a, a bunch of tools for industrial designers, so these are folks that are going to be the next generation of designers, to do sustainable product design. And the team behind Autodesk that put this together really has done a wonderful job. So they talk about lifetime, uh, life cycle thinking. They have a whole section of workshops on improving product lifetime. Um, and, and they talk about how to design products for repair and upgrade. And they have these marvelous videos, and I'll, uh, uh, I'll mute this and, and play a little bit of this video. Um, so they talk about how to design products to be modular um, and, and upgradable. They talk about making service manuals available. They talk about everything that I'm saying here. So this is not, this is not new information. That's not me that's the one coming up with this. This is the consensus amongst the sustainable design community. Um, unfortunately, what's, I, what's happening is either this curriculum isn't being widely enough distributed or is being taught in schools, but then it's not making its way in, into companies or companies are letting business decisions override some of these, um, some of these ideas. Another thing that we're doing, we have a, a, a program called iFixit EDU, and we have engineering students at about 40 universities around the country writing repair manuals. So a lot of the content that's on iFixit actually comes from students at universities around the world. Uh, and um, I can show you if we see current universities. So you may find a university near you on this list. This is our list of, of current schools. Uh, so if you recognize the logo of your alma mater, uh, their technical writing program, usually it's in either the engineering or the English department, is working with us. Uh, and we've got about 40 universities around the country doing it. We had 10,000 students go through the program so far, uh, and it's working really, really well. So we're trying. We're really scaling up our education effort, but it's, it, I mean, this is a long-term initiative. Okay, uh, this, uh, this question actually came from an email from a person who couldn't attend today. Uh, they wanted me to ask this question to you. The New York State Legislature recently passed a law, a new law requiring all smoke detectors to have non-removal batteries that last 10 mm -hmm. years, and this person is not sure that this has a de desired effect of improving safety. It seems like people just discard the unit and not replace it, especially since it's more significantly more expensive than new batteries. Do you have a comment on that? I didn't know about that. <laughs> That's news to me. Uh, yeah, I, we're seeing this happen with more and more products where these lithium batteries, I mean, it's possible to make a battery that lasts 10 years, and so let's say, well, we'll integrate it. Um, let's just, for the sake of argument, say that from an environmental perspective, uh, it is equivalent to manufacture a new smoke detector every 10 years as it was to, say, replace that battery 10 times. Is it? I'm not sure, but let's just say that it is. Um, really, the f folks who lose in this situation are the recyclers because you've got this, the, I mean, you had a battery that was going to go to a segmented battery stream. Now what you have is this big plastic block with a battery integrated in somewhere inside that maybe it's easy to get at, but it probably has tamper-proof screws on it. 
right? So you've got some new screw that you have to learn. You've got smoke detectors coming through the recycling stream. Historically, all smoke detectors have been very recyclable, right? It's an easily removable uh, nine volt battery. Uh, now you've got this battery, and if you run, you know, products with lithium batteries into a shredder, it's going to be an ignition source if it has any charge at all. And if you have suspended aluminum or metal dust in that shredder, it will cause an explosion. And we have documented evidence of these explosions at shredders around the world. So we have to separate. We have to remove batteries before they go into the shred. So that sounds like a law that was maybe well-intentioned but hasn't thought through the recycling implications of it. Uh, and you know, I'd be happy to talk with the New York State legislators about it. We're actually, I mean, we have, uh, we, we have an active relationship with a bunch of folks in New York because, um, because of the, the right to repair campaign that's happening there. So this is a promotion page for it. And we've generated over 10,000 letters to uh, legislators. So the legislators in New York all know about right to repair. I don't know if they know about design for recycling, but maybe that's something that we can teach them. Yeah, this person referenced a, a blog from uh, NFPA Today uh, dot blog. It has a bunch of other stuff, but it's the NFPA Today blog. I don't know if that'll get you to where you need to go to look at it, but if anybody wants to follow up on that. Uh, the next okay. question uh, comes from an electronic recycler who has a box of a uh, full box of cell phones. I imagine that's a Gaylord box. Is there yeah. any way to find out what parts are valuable or most needed for repairs? Uh, they would like to recover them uh, for future use. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you can look at the parts values on the market. Um, we've talked about developing a tool to do this. It's a missing piece of infrastructure that doesn't exist right now. I mean, in an ideal world, you punch in the, the model number and then some tool would tell you, okay, the screen and the, the battery and the main board are each worth $5. So separate those and then shred the rest. Um, we don't have that infrastructure in the electronics uh, marketplace today. Um, the car junkyard guys have it. The car recyclers have it, but the electronics folks don't. Uh, so in lieu of that, I would just um, guess at the parts inside and, you know, I mean, you, you have a good idea. I mean, it's the things that, it's the phones that are worth money where they have parts that are worth money. So modern Androids, modern iPhones, uh, those are all going to have components that are worthwhile. Um, what most recyclers do is, you know, the, if, if you're at smaller scale, they'll say, well, if I have five broken iPhones, maybe I can, you know, combine them to make three functional iPhones. So you can have your technicians do that. Um, Beyond that, you really have to have enough scale to be able to sell it. If you can't figure it out yourself, you know, you could sell it to a savvy recycler, uh, someone like Electronics Recyclers International or Regency Technologies or some of these big guys are definitely parting out cell phones. So when they give you a price for the phones, it ought to include at least some assumption of value recovery for the parts. I'm sorry if that isn't a wonderful answer. You can also go on iFixit and search for the part and you'll see what we sell it for and that gives you an idea of the market rate. Okay, this question says, we're recycling and surplus operation. We run into many lab items that need a repair. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, we don't have any of that type of item on your site. What's the best way to find yeah. how to repair them? <laughs> That's a great question. And I actually, uh, so I'm interested if you could clarify, I don't know if you can get more information, but is this like scientific lab equipment or uh, telecommunications equipment? Yeah, I would, I would, um, I would think uh, a lab, chemistry lab maybe. Yeah. I mean, everything from, I mean, I'm sitting here, we have a microscope over here that we're trying to fix right now. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, my answer would be I would love to have repair information uh, for that kind of product on iFixit. And uh, the easy, straightforward way to do that is send me one. So this is an open call to anybody. Uh, if you have something that you wish that iFixit had a repair manual for that we do not, send me one of it. And I will give it, get it in the hands of students, maybe students at Penn State, and they will take it apart and write a repair manual for it. And then there will be a repair manual on iFixit. And then maybe that will help you the next time that you get it in. So this is kind of an open offer to the recycling community because I know how hard it is. You have all these streams, you have this interesting stuff come through and you have no idea what's involved or how to fix it. Uh, I have somebody who's gonna send me a, uh, a touch screen from a John Deere tractor and he says, hey, this thing is $7,000. You have to find a way to fix it, but I don't have the time to, so he's sending me one and we're gonna, we're gonna give it to students and see if we can fix this John Deere touch screen. So you're right, we don't have much lab equipment, uh, but that's just because I don't have it. So if you give it to me, I will write repair manuals and then they'll be available the next time you get some in. Yeah, this comments on the back to the smoke detectors. Uh, most have a radioactive source and should not be shredded. Uh, so I guess- Yeah, that's probably true. Panels. So how do you recycle a smoke detector? Yeah, good question. I don't know. 
Uh, somebody here, somebody here knows and is like raising their hand. Whoever knows what you do with smoke detectors, <laughs> tell us in the chat. So. I remember the story about the radioactive Boy Scout that collected like a thousand smoke detectors and <laughs> took the radioactive source out, and then he ended up having this huge, you know, hazardous thing. I could. Got a special badge for that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, this one person asked that they could do a, a quick uh, example of a of a successful fix. You know, something in, on your website, perhaps a quick video. Sure. Sure, I can show you. So, um, yeah, let's look. And maybe I should have. Uh, I'm going to for that. So if I go, I fix it, and I click Repair Guides. This is the page. And so we can look and see. So, like, here is, like, replacing the keys on a uh, uh, keyboard. Here's replacing a string on a guitar. We're kind of featuring musical instrument repair. Um, we've been talking about iPhones a lot, so let's go and look at an iPhone. Go Apple phone, iPhone. We'll look at the iPhone 6 because that's the one I have sitting here. And so let's say that you want to replace the battery. So every year and a half, the battery on these uh, on these things wears out. So to get inside, there are two magical screwdrivers or screws that Apple doesn't want you to have. They won't sell you the screwdriver, but I will. So you can buy the screwdriver for me. It is uh, $7.95. That's the screwdriver. And then we use a suction cup tool. You can use any suction cup, but th because there's glass, you use a little bit of, uh, of pressure to get it off. There's, this is an alternative with a suction cup. And then you lift this up, and there's a couple little, so there's like five screws you have to remove here. Um, connector, disconnect these connectors. And then um, they, there's, this is the battery connector. Um, they use these kind of fancy adhesive pull tabs. So the battery is glued down, but they're using a special adhesive that comes off without heat. So this is a very nice, friendly thing for Apple to do for us. Uh, and if that doesn't work, you can use some heat, and then this is getting the battery out. So it, it, we make this actually look a little more complicated than it is. Uh, this says it's 27 steps. It's really uh, only about 10. Uh, we just include a couple of different alternatives depending on what tool that you have. But like replacing a battery in an iPhone, I think we list this as a moderate difficulty repair. I would say if you've ever tinkered with electronics at all, you'd be pretty comfortable replacing the battery in this in this iPhone. Um, See if I can show another repair. Uh, cameras. There's all kinds of digital cameras out there. If you crack the screen on a camera, um, it's it can be pretty straightforward to get in and fix, even on like these fancy SLRs. So we've got like an Nikon D3100. Um, you know, here's a it's an autofocus configuration guide. Here's a guide on how to how to swap out the lens ring. So some of these repairs are, I mean, it might seem like, oh, there's no way I can fix my camera. This is a really straightforward, easy, easy uh, repair. And here at the bottom of the page, you can see so 600 people have uh, looked at or used this guide. So that's exciting. There's all kinds. I mean, there's so many things. And pe people always ask me to say, oh, Kyle, well, do you have repair manuals for oscilloscopes? And I'll say, no, we don't have repair manuals for oscilloscopes. And then I go and I look, and sure enough, we do. So I, the, the community has completely eclipsed my knowledge of the site. There's so much repair information online that I don't even know is there. Kyle, is there, are there any particular items that you're looking for to take apart and fix? Well, the lab scientific equipment would be interesting. Uh, we are always interested in expanding laptops. Um, so the, the e if you have laptops coming through and you're like, well, would this be a good one to send to iFixit? You can just kind of search for the model number or look for it. And if we have it, great. And if we don't, then we're interested. So like if I go uh, here, Dell. So Dell has made hundreds, thousands of different laptop models. Um, so you know we have a bunch, but we don't have all of them. So we're definitely always interested in more laptops, particularly newer laptops. Um, this is uh, Inspiron. So here we've got, so this is a student created repair guide. So if you want to upgrade the RAM in your Dell laptop, here you go. But it's going to be different for an Inspiron 1500 than a 1600. So we need one of each. Um, we are interested in, uh, I mean, across the board, we have a pretty good, uh, and if you email us, I can send you a wish list of what we're interested in, but it's pretty much anything that you look at, and you're like, yeah, that might be worth fixing, and then you search for it on iFixit, and we don't have it, we want one of those. Okay, great. All right, I think we're a little out of questions, but uh, here's one quick comment on the, uh, back to the smoke detectors. If you call okay. First Alert or BRK, uh, they will give you some information on properly handling this, this material. Uh, be sure to have the model number ready and other information on the on the unit. So there are some outlets there. Uh, get rid of your 
your smoke detector. It sounds like it says just send them back to the yeah. manufacturer. Yep, they'll take them back. Right. Some Sears locations are designated collection sites. Okay, so somewhere in the country there is the smoke detector recycler. We need to find out where they are and get their story. I'm always I'm always astonished. I learn about all these specialized recyclers. I met one guy where he said all they do is they re recycle Keurigs. And he said one of the problems that they have is that um, when Keurig, so, you know, it's a coffee machine and it gets clogged. And so Keurig's customer support people tell people, well, if your Keurig is clogged, flush it with vinegar. Uh, and maybe that will clear it up, which is a reasonable fix. But then he says they get all the units in the recycling that uh, Keurig, Keurig has told people to pour vinegar in. And the vinegar gets on their shredder blades and rusts their shredder blades. Uh, so it's a it's an integrated ecosystem and solving this problem is hard it requires communication from everybody and that's that's why I mean I'm really grateful for all of you for taking the time to listen to me because I think the more that the repair and recycling and manufacturing communities work together and exchange this knowledge uh, the better ecosystem we're going to have, and, and I think the more money we can generate out of both the recycling and repair ecosystems, which will uh, be a net benefit for uh, for the environment. Okay, and here's another uh, outlet for uh, smoke detectors. We should just do a webinar on those. Uh, it's <laughs> Curie Environmental Services, C U R I E Services dot com. So these are if you need to recycle something uh, that is radioactive, you go to these guys. All right, radioactive waste management. There you go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that'll be our next webinar. No, <laughs> okay, I think we're, out of, we're just about out of time. So uh, again, thank you, Kyle, for this great presentation, and, and thank you for the audience for for providing these great great questions and uh, participating. Uh, so uh, we're going to close now. Uh, again, like this webinar, uh, like all the webinars that we've uh, had in this series, has been recorded and will be made available via YouTube links on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. Uh, thanks again for joining us. We hope you'll join us for next month's webinar. Please visit the NRC and RMC websites for schedule updates. And have a great day, everybody, and, and thank you again, Kyle. Thanks, everybody.